Pulp Fiction, the quintessential Tarantino movie. The movie that really, really put him on the map. Yes, Reservoir Dogs was his first, and he definitely got a good amount of attention for it, but it was Pulp Fiction that really made Quentin Tarantino the name that he is today. And it's hard to talk about a movie that is so beloved, not only by yourself, but by mostly everybody. This is, you know, it, here's what's interesting about Pulp Fiction and other Quentin Tarantino works. This film is uber popular, as we, as I have just stated, but it's very surprising to me that it is. Because when I watch this movie, I feel like it should be hated by a good majority of the masses. And it really makes me wonder how sheepish people are. How they can have their opinions molded by critics and the status quo, you know, the popular opinion the moral majority because having not watched it for a while I mean I still remember every freaking word of this movie but going back and rewatching it now and I got to watch this with a 16 year old kid who had never seen this movie before and uh, that was you know a whole other experience unto itself just watching it through his eyes um, in his generation and seeing how timeless this movie actually is and how well made it is uh, to be able to stand the test of time 25 years later. I saw this movie when I was 12 years old in theaters and I just didn't really grasp the scope of it at the time, but I did still appreciate it as much as I was capable. But I just, watching it again, watching it with a critical eye, I suppose, now that I've started this channel and, and have tried to look a little more in depth into films. And um, I'm not here to critique this movie because I think it's flawless, so there's nothing to critique in that way. But I guess I will, I will form my opinion on whether or not the audience is wholly... Mm, capable of making their own decisions about their opinion because there's so many times that I listen to an average everyday moviegoer who doesn't really love film all that much they're just kind of you know um, a casual film goer and a lot of the complaints that they make about movies in general are this movie kind of embodies a good majority of those things. You know, um, too much emphasis on violence and profanity and sexual deviance and drug use. And it's weird to me that this movie is as loved as it is. It has an 8.9 on IMDb. I want to say it's in like the top five ever. And if you talk to most people, and I've been a hairdresser for a very long time, so I've talked to film uh, with a good majority of them. Anytime Pulp Fiction is brought up, almost everyone I talk to does love it. And Quentin Tarantino in general. But this is coming from the same people who hate ultra-violent movies, who hate movies with um, shameful characters or characters that seem to... Um, you know, anti-hero type characters where they're like, I don't understand that stuff. I like my characters to be wholesome and I want them to be like Captain America where they're, you know, good at their core and this and that. Quentin Tarantino doesn't write characters like that. His movies are never like that. His characters are extremely flawed. So it just, I don't know. I, I wanted to spend a minute talking or five minutes talking about how as much as I love this film and as much as I do think it is worthy of all the praise that it gets, I'm confused by it. The same thing goes with lots of movies that come out that I do not understand why they're beloved by the majority 
when those are all the things that they supposedly don't like about movies. I remember when Mad Max Fury Road was nominated for Best Picture. I was genuinely shocked by that. Do I think it's worthy of that? Yes. I think it's one of the best action movies ever made. But the level of violence and the lack of plot and dialogue and the stuff that people constantly complain about in their movies, all of a sudden, once the critics and once you know the general consensus, which usually seems to be formed in like a few days or a week, these people just jump on the train and they're like, yeah, amazing. And it's like, do you think that? Or does everyone else think that? I don't know. So, but as I said, I think this movie is completely worth every single praise. 8.9 is too low for me. It should be a 10 out of 10. Everyone should give it a 10. It's a perfect film. Now, of course, I'm being a little ridiculous there because I don't expect every mo- everybody to love a certain movie. That's just impossible. We all have differences of opinions. But this, for me, is the greatest dialogue film ever made because that's what this movie is. I mean, that's what's incredible about Quentin Tarantino is that he can write dialogue that is so well-delivered and so interesting and so memorable and so iconic that the characters can be talking about something that really does not drive the plot forward at all. It's mostly just a couple people bantering about shit. Do you think that talking about Royale with cheese and the metric system and all that stuff really has anything to do with anything in the movie? No. But it's so funny and it's so well delivered that you wouldn't want that cut out of the movie. That's the kind of stuff that hits the editing floor in a lot of movies and it's like the charm of the film is there's a lot of banter between a couple people and it's just them kind of shooting the shit not really applying to the overall arc of the story. And as far as the story goes, of course, as Quentin usually does, and and, uh, I mean, he did it in Reservoir, but he also does it really heavily here, and I feel like this is kind of becomes his signature at this point. He has a very non-linear way of telling stories, but to do it in such a way that it's almost a mystery revealed as the film progresses and you get to see why things happened like this when they were placed here, and there's a method to the madness. And this movie is just great at being chaotic. Um, watching it with somebody who had never seen it was really, was really cool, because I, you know, it's, it's Pulp Fiction. It's like a fucking Empire Strikes Back or something. You're not apt to find many people who haven't seen it, and usually the people who you do find that haven't seen it are like, no, I won't watch that. That's against what I would watch. And, you know, yap, 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 blah, blah, blah. But uh, he was young and he was open to watch whatever. So we watched a few movies and this was the end one of the night. And this ran till 3.30 in the morning because we didn't start it till very late. And this kid fell asleep through Silence of the Lambs. Not that he didn't like it, but he was very tired. And then he woke back up after a couple hours and he came down and I was like, hey, I'm starting Pulp Fiction right now. You want to check it out? And he was like, yeah, sure. And he sat there through the whole thing, just wide eyed, like laughing and having such a good time. Sat through a freaking two and a half hour movie that late after having been as tired as he was. So I feel like that, um, you know, is a testament to how great this movie is and how timeless it is. Even his generation at 16 years of age, this movie was made before he was even born, well before he was even born. Um, But it still resonates. It still lands. And that's, I mean, I can't say enough good about this movie. I can't say enough. Can you say enough good about this movie? Is there a collection of words you can put together that would fully um, do justice to this film? I don't think so. I mean, (laughs) this movie is perfect. So let's talk about the film now that we're like 10 minutes into the damn thing. But uh, I just wanted to talk about this movie and what an impact it's had and how 
hypocritical I think a lot of people can be and uh, yeah okay um, so we got the opening scene here with Honey Bunny and what Jules uh, later coins him uh, Ringo and what it I mean I tell you <laughs> it is though I mean I don't want to I don't want to sound like a broken record here but iconic this is just such an iconic opening sequence there's so many iconic scenes within this movie I mean, almost every every segment of this movie, because if you look at this movie like an anthology, which it essentially kind of is, um, I feel like every segment has its own iconic sequence or three. And uh, this opening, I mean, I remember I remember seeing this, I, and every time I watch it, I kind of have the same exact feeling. It's just you know we get this opening sequence. Um, and there are these very, um, you know, these very well-composed uh, people talking about robbing, you know, banks and, and, and then, of course, later realizing they should be doing restaurants. And then you know, um, Honey Bunny is, is so relaxed and so sweet and innocent feeling. And then she just kind of breaks out of that and gets into character and uh, just comes out swinging with this. I'll execute every last one of you motherfuckers. Which I feel like if you were to play those back to back, I don't feel like the one in the later sequence when it plays at the very end is the exact same as the one in the beginning. I think the, the last couple words have been altered. So I think that's a different take. But I could be wrong on that. Maybe because it like freeze frames there and the music starts, the miserloo, which... I mean, anytime you hear that song, of course, it's going to be attached to Pulp Fiction. It like right when she hits that, and her, you know, her face freezes, and it just, but you know, the music kicks in. It's just fucking perfect. It. I'm trying not to just gush all over this movie, but it's hard not to when you love a movie so damn much like this. It's. It's incredible. It really is. Um, and yeah, he's right. I mean, nobody ever robs restaurants and their idea of getting all the wallets together is probably going to have more than the register ever would. And all the people are just unprepared for it, especially that early in the morning. Um, yeah, makes total sense. This was the this was the career revival. I remember this as a kid when in 94 when this came out. Travolta's career was dead. You know, it was, it was like it barely had a pulse if it had any life left in it. And this just completely elevated him back into stardom. Um, but for me, the, you know, the performance of performances in this movie. You know, if you're, if you're gonna, if you're gonna pick out one person in this movie to be like, that's the guy that made this movie. That's hard because I feel like every player, every perf everybody's perfectly casted in their roles and they all play them so well. But Samuel L. Jackson is just the heart of this movie. He breathes such life into every single segment that he steals every scene that he's in, every scene that he's a part of. This was like Sam Jackson at his very best. And he's been in a lot of movies. I mean, this was the guy that was in more movies than anybody in the 1990s. And that might still be true to this day. That guy used to make three, four, five movies a year. But this is his defining role, in my opinion. And he, he, no one on planet Earth could have played Jules as well as Samuel Jackson. There's just no fucking way. I feel like, I feel like, as I said, I feel like everybody else is perfectly casted. Don't get me wrong. But if you were to recast anybody else in this movie, it wouldn't hurt as much as if you casted somebody else's jewels. <laughs> the way he delivers every line, the subtle humor in almost every single thing he says, like the way he takes this character and makes it him, makes it his own, is incredible. I mean, I could sit here and quote lines all day from him, 
One of my favorite is when they're talking about the foot massages and he's like, shit, yeah, I got my technique down. I don't be tickling or nothing. That stuff just kills me every fucking time. And it's just, as I said, it's kind of throwaway banter technically, but it's so good and it's so well acted and it's so funny that you just eat it up and you're like, I'll take fucking two more hours. I could listen to Jules and and Vincent Vega talk for three more hours with a smile on my face the whole time. Just just Vince sitting in the car, driving around and talking about his time over in Europe. Talking about being in Amsterdam and then Holland and all I could watch I could watch an entire movie just with those two guys driving around talking about that. That's how fucking funny they are. That's how well written they are. That's how well their characters are imagined. I mean, of course, the fucking, you know, Ezekiel 29, 17, the path of the righteous. I mean, like that whole thing, yet again, iconic, but it is just incredible. <sighs> the way, <laughs> though, his look, you know, he's got the, he's got the freaking, he's got the glistening hair. He's, he sprayed some soul glow in there. And uh, just when he goes and he talks to Brett and, even when they get to the door and they're like, all right, time to get into character. Like, they're like bullshitting. They're like buddy, buddy, you know, friends out there. And then he literally says, like, we have to get into character. And then they have to go and be, you know, almost pretend to be these badass guys. And at the end of the movie, when he's talking to Ringo, he says, you know, I never really gave much thought to what that all meant. I just thought it was some cold-blooded shit to say to somebody before I popped a cast cap in their ass. I'm paraphrasing here because I don't want people to be like, unsubscribe, he said the word, no one's allowed to say, but black people, okay, fine. <laughs> but, you know, that sequence is hilarious just to me it's fucking everything about it the whole scene with brett kills me every time but this is true of every sequence in the movie so all right but yeah just the 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 big kahuna burger now who the fuck would big kahuna burger really be selling burgers at 7 a.m because it's 7 30 when they come through the door and Brett already has it. So they had already went out and came back, but they're just now starting to eat the food and Jules and them have been outside that door for 10 minutes because they get there at 7.22 and they're not supposed to go to the door till 7.30. So eight minutes they've been sitting there and these guys, when he looks at the burger, it's barely been eaten. The fries seem to not be all that munched on. So what, he just, like, wouldn't he have came back with them? Like, I'm out getting burgers right now. Shouldn't we come through the door together? Like, it, or no burger at all? Like, just, it's funny to me. He already seems to have one. And that ain't no, like, I put it in the fridge and I'm eating it in the morning. No, that is fresh. But would a burger joint really be open at 7 in the morning selling burgers? I don't know. Maybe. But, yeah, I just found that to be really funny. Like, burgers and he's like the cornerstone of every nutritious breakfast and it's like i know he's probably being facetious there but burgers for breakfast people really eat that anyway uh, or 25 17 is it 29 no it's 25 17 ezekiel 25 17 yeah i yeah, am yeah. the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides with a tyranny yeah okay um now what is in the case? What's in the box, right? I mean, that's the age-old question when it comes to Pulp Fiction. I've seen people talk about that it's Marcellus Wallace's soul. Um, and I feel like there's some credence to this because when Jules and Vincent execute Brett, the soul flashes, the, the gold light flashes as they do, as if something, like, I don't know. I don't know how to take that sequence because it happens a couple other times throughout the film and it happens in moments where people are doing something that they probably shouldn't be doing, though they definitely shouldn't be doing, which is every single thing in this movie. But here's the thing with this. like, I do feel like this is fairly religiously based because of Jules' epiphany that he just witnessed a miracle and that he's going to walk the earth like Kang from Kung Fu or decided to be a bum. 
Um, but because he does that, he either A, lives, B, gets his partner killed, or C, both. Which, it's both for sure, but it just depends on the way you look at it. I guess the way you would look at it is Vincent did not recognize the miracle. Jules did. Jules left the life. Vincent didn't. Vincent died, and Jules did not. So, you know, Butch comes in the room, and, and that would have been Jules there with him, their partner, but because Jules left, that's why Marcellus Wallace is there in his stead. And Marcellus Wallace gets raped, and Vincent loses his life. And these are two guys who didn't. And Vince had no... I mean, I guess, yeah, at that time... No, this would have been... Yeah, this would have, their soul, his soul would have been returned to him. So his soul gets returned to him, and then he's raped. <laughs> that made him mortal again, right? There you go. So, yeah, without a soul, he could kind of exist without, with a, outside of the realm of God's law. But once he was granted back his soul, he was mortal again. Uh, like, you know, like with a soul, and now he could be raped. I'm going way out of control here. And I don't want to make it seem like I'm genuinely feeling like this, but it's kind of fun to yap about. And who knows? I haven't really thought about it, to be completely honest. Um, and, oh man, I, I, there's so many interesting choices here that you just never see in movies like Butch getting talked to by Marcellus Wallace and he's like, fuck pride, all that stuff, which is actually a really good speech and it's very true. People should listen to Marcellus on that. Fuck pride. Like, take the money and run. It's okay. You know, you know who the fuck are you proving anything to? But that all not, you know, being said, uh, the shot of just Bruce Willis as someone is talking to him in one long tag, not showing the guy talking at all, and then eventually showing the back of his head and not showing his face until way later into the movie is a very interesting choice. It reminds me of like, uh, oh, what is that, Inspector Gadget, right? <laughs> I think that's that cartoon. I never watched a hell of, a lot of that, to be honest which is weird because I'm Mr. Pop Culture, but I didn't really watch much of that. But that's that one, right, where you never see the guy's face and he just, like, presses the buttons and has the cat. Um, and um, Rosanna Arquette in this movie. I've never really been a big fan of her physically, but in this movie, I like her haircut and I like her look and I think she's pretty damn attractive. Um, but uh, the, 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 the lady of ladies uh, in this movie is uh, Fabian. Oh, Fabian is just adorable to me. And Uma Thurman as well. Uh, Mrs. Mia Wallace. Uh, she's gorgeous. But I'm going to give it to Fabian. I think she's just so unbelievably adorable in this movie. Um, but uh, Mia Wallace is sexier, for sure. Um, and, I mean, even Tarantino's so incredible that he even makes buying drugs seem cool and interesting. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Maybe, you know, maybe people would be enticed to go out and try. It's like, wow, that looks really fun, or that looks cool, or that's really interesting, or whatever. So maybe he has a downside to it, but it doesn't make him any less of a, an amazing filmmaker. Uh, Pepsi Challenge. I love that line here because I use it all the fucking time. Anytime I'm trying to compare something, I'll be like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go to take that Pepsi challenge with that shit any day of the week, especially when it comes to movies. I'll put it to the Pepsi challenge with anything. A line that I stole from this movie and uh, been using it for 25 freaking years. Um, and I love that Vince has to get high to take her out. He can't fucking handle that he has to take out Mia Wallace. Um, and the whole, like, up on the screen, I'm, I'm guessing this is just illustrating how high both of them are, that they can actually see the square, which is actually a rectangle, but whatever. Don't be a rectangle, man. No, don't be a square, because she can actually see it, and it, like, fades on the screen. So I don't know if that's him seeing it, or her seeing it, or both of them seeing it. 
but I just think it's really funny that I actually put that in there. Uh, Jackrabbit Slims is so damn cool. And with this collector's edition DVD, this, this new format that just came out, okay, I'm, I'm a little behind the times on certain things, but uh, it has a Jackrabbit Slims menu right here full actual menu inside which is really really cool i love that damn uh restaurant in this movie i think it's funny to see steve buscemi there playing buddy holly um there's the five dollar milkshake that's still just milk and ice cream right it costs five dollars oh the way his eye like like barely can lift when he's like it's pretty good pretty good goddamn milkshake i don't know if it's worth five dollars that his performance there is is excellent and then of course the amazing da dance sequence, which I kept trying to point out. I, I, you know what I should have done with this 16 year old kid who just watched it for the first time is after the movie without saying anything to him, just be like, which scenes do you feel like would be iconic in the future? Like, is there anything that stuck out to you that you would be like, oh wow, like I'm sure that this now 25 years later is still something everybody remembers. And I'd be curious on if he was to point out a couple of these um, very memorable sequences kind of in film history with the uh, the dance, the eye, this. Oh my God, I remember how big of a deal this scene was when, when Travolta was doing that shit with his eyes on the dance floor. It, it was such a big deal and it still fucking is. Not of course as big of a deal as it was back then, but iconic scenes live on for many, 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 many years, um, sometimes indefinitely. So yeah, it would have been. I should have inter I should have like interviewed. I should have had him on the damn channel here, but you know, not everybody wants to be in front of the camera. I've asked a few friends in the past, and I'm like, hey, you want to come in there? Like, Fuck no, I don't want to be in front of a bunch of people listening. I'm like, don't worry, no one watches anyway. Uh, especially when you're like 30 minutes in, you only have like five people left at this point. So hi, five people. Um, <laughs> So that would be good. Uh, Uma's hair in this is freaking awesome as a hairdresser. I just, I love her haircut in this. It frames her face so well. It's just such a freaking awesome haircut on her. Um, and I'm sure it's a wig, but it doesn't matter. It still looks great. Uh, the Fox Force 5 stuff, I feel like, is, you know, kind of the groundwork for what would later become Kill Bill. you you got to, of course, um, trace that back to that. And uh, him trying to talk himself out of fucking Mia, I've definitely had that conversation many, many times. Kind of reminds me of the pep talk that Ryan Reynolds' character has to have with himself in waiting about the uh, underage hostess up at the front. I've had that same similar experience when I was in a, my early 20s where you're just like, don't do it, man. Don't fucking do it. You can't do it. And you sit there and you're in the mirror and you're like, okay, so what we need to do here is we need to weigh out the pros and the cons, but he's more just kind of like, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go out there. You're going to say thanks for the evening, blah, blah, blah. You're going to go home. You're going to jerk off and that's all you're going to do. It's like, this really happens for any woman who's ever like watched this and i'm sure women have done this as well but i can speak for men in this regard that we definitely do at times when we know that we shouldn't do something we actually do have a conscience and we actually do some of us anyway some of us just do whatever the fuck we want because we're assholes but that's true of all people uh, we actually do we, we we don't want to do things and we have to really really go off and be like look oh my god okay no no you're not gonna do this absolutely not and half the time you probably end up doing it because if you had to talk yourself up that much any little shove is gonna is gonna even a little nudge is gonna push you into doing it so if you go out there and she gets pushy it's like no oh, no i don't have the willpower to deal with that um, and then she ODs and this whole sequence is so fucking intense. Like I, you know, the kid I was watching it with, I, I felt like he was having almost an anxiety attack back there. He's just like, holy fuck, holy fuck. You know, he's racing her. Fuck you, Lance answer. I said that every time I've ever called anyone and they don't answer. I always say, fuck you, Lance answer. Oh, I love that line. But what he calls him is, Are you calling me on a cellular telephone? <laughs> Prank caller, prank caller just throws it down and crashes in. This is a great sequence as well because he comes in, crashes the car. Lance, what the fuck? You know, his girlfriend, uh, 
freaking oh what's his wife sorry was that the one with all the shit in her face no that's trudy right trudy my wife oh that's so fucking funny but he comes up on the lawn boom hits she's like, what the fuck which she doesn't do that until like after the car has already wrecked into the house and as you can see the house actually is pretty wrecked over there in that corner they didn't really put enough focus on that but it is all in one take so that's one hell of a take to be able to drive that car up on there boom he comes out he's dragging her across the lawn this fucked up bitch is marcellus wallace's wife now i will be forced to tell him oh so damn good so damn good um and then just the needle in the heart that needle looks like it would go all the way through her and back out the other side i feel like that needle is a little long my little black fucking medical book i gotta stab her three times that line holy shit what he does he's like he really does bring down his fucking thing four times but i mean who the hell is counting but the whole thing was like <laughs> do I, I no you know i gotta stab her three times Ah, oh, fuck, Eric Stoltz, so good in this. Marty McFly, eh, the original, for like a month. Uh, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. And then, like, uh, the the girl that's hanging out with him, maybe that's Trudy. I think that's the one that's Trudy. And then uh, that's, God, I can't remember the names now. Fuck, I'm getting them all mixed up. But whoever the stoner chick is on the couch that he's trying to get Vincent to bang and do drugs with. It's like, uh, or maybe it's his wife. Oh, I think, no, it's his wife. I'm sorry. That's, no, I'm wrong. It's, it's Pat Patricia, or Patricia. Now I'm on Patricia Arquette because I just watched True Romance. So Roseanne Arquette. I was fucking trippy. Another fantastic line. Then she goes home. She tells him the ketchup joke, which I've told that joke, um, admittedly, a few times since I've heard, seen the movie to anyone uh, who hasn't seen the movie. And uh, the Christopher Walken stuff with the watch up the ass. Hilarious. Just to tell that kid that kind of stuff. To tell a child that you had something up your ass, and then just the quick joke. This is, this is why this movie. There's so many things that are just so fast, and and they're just moments that you're just like you don't even get them, or you do, and it, but you're just like trying to catch up. Like the fact that he says that his fucking dad had that hunk of metal up his ass for five years, and then died of, and he like pauses, and he just kind of blurts out dysentery and moves on really quick is hilarious. The guy died of dysentery from having a fucking watch up his ass. That, I mean, yeah, the humor in this is... I mean, this is more of a comedy than anything. I don't feel like it's labeled as a comedy, but I see it as one because I'm laughing almost the entire film. Um, and then... Uh, so but the whole Butch thing... This is another, I mean, God, it's already 32 minutes in. We're gonna try, I'm going to try to streamline right past this. But the Butch stuff is great. The, you know, Jules getting shot through the thing is, is super unexpected in the moment. Um, the, the scene of, you bring out the gimp! And he brings him in there, and then he opens the door, and he's ass-raping him, and he's got the sword. I mean, I think this is further illustrating that he's going to at some point make some kind of a you know ninja samurai type of movie um, some kind of sword kung fu sword fu wire fu kind of movie and uh, yeah that scene is pretty fucking hilarious man I mean it's fucked up and it's one of those things where you're like holy shit they're actually showing him getting ass raped like you don't see that in movies almost ever especially you know a movie that was nominated for best picture and come on I mean, I know there's a lot of Forrest Gump lovers out there, and that's fine and all. Like, it's a cute movie, and it's iconic in its own ways, but it was up against Pulp Fiction and The Shawshank Redemption that year, and no. <laughs> it is not better than either of those movies. That's tough, man. Shawshank or this, that's, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Those are, two of the, those are like two of the greatest films ever made. And they both came out the same year. But Forrest Gump ain't even in the top 100 or anywhere near it for me personally. Now, of course, it's going to be... And I get the pick because it's more family-friendly and it's probably going to be... But have you ever really met many people who don't like Shawshank or this, really? Like, yeah, anyway. Fucking Forrest Gump. <sighs> um, and then, oh man, Fabian talking about her pot belly. Agreed. So adorable. A girl with just a little pop belly and everything else is just normal. Sexy as fuck. Her asking for oral pleasure just makes her more adorable. Um, him losing his temper on her about not remembering the watch and then calming down and then going back out in the car and losing his temper again. 
guilty, I, I can definitely do stuff like that. Um, and um, him coming, and I, we kind of all talked about that. The Zed's deadline, of course, is is super uh, memorable as well. And then um, Marcellus Wallace was the one who was out getting them coffee and donuts. Does Marcellus Wallace look like the errand boy? Like, does he seem like the guy that would be like, all right, Vince, like, I'm going to go out and get the, you wait here, I'm going to go do the grunt work. Like, wouldn't they have that shit delivered to them by somebody else? It's just weird that he's the one. Because it couldn't just be randomly that he was just down the street. But I feel like Bruce is driving for a long while before he runs into him. That seems like a distance to drive for just coffee and regular donuts. Of course, I'm overthinking things as usual, but whatever. Um, and one, there's some fuck-ups for sure in any movie, but one I noticed here was the bullet holes are in the wall behind Jules and Vince before he that guy comes out of the garage, which is uh, Alexis Arquette, unless my eyes are playing a trick on me. Freaking George from... Uh, Wedding Singer and uh, Bride of Chucky and you know plenty of other stuff. Unfortunately, he is no longer with us. But when he comes out and he fires that can, oh fucking that line! So many great lines. Did you see that gun? It was bigger than him. It's just a fucking exaggeration, but I love it. And the bullet holes are behind them there in that moment. Uh, the other scene, I mean, another hilarious sequence here is just him shooting Marvin in the face and be like, ah oh, shit, I shot Marvin in the face. Like it's no big deal. It's an everyday occurrence. Uh, oh, you send in the wolf? That's all you had to say. That's great stuff. You're the motherfucker that should be on brain detail. Every time my fingers touch brain, I become super fly TNT. Like, all that stuff. Great. Just, I mean, let's keep going here. Um, <laughs> when the whole Jimmy, you know, the, the, the you know, dead storage thing, as I said, I'm, I'm going to, you know, play nice for everybody. But that whole fucking sequence, hilarious. The, he gives them the clothes, and he, what do they look like? They look like a couple of dorks. Ah, motherfucker, the your clothes. Ah, such a great reply. And then uh, the, the conversation, the argument between Jules and Vince there, that the, you're going to be a fucking bum without a place of residence or a job. That's what you're going to be. You're going to be a fucking bum. Love it. Um, and then, yeah, Ringo gets to kind of see what's in there, and, and uh, we never do get to find out what is in that case, but... Uh, you know, I don't know, gold, who knows. Um, and uh, Jules just happened to catch him on a uh, on a special day where he doesn't want to kill. And you can tell that the robbers in this really don't want to kill. Like, I mean, that's what they say earlier. Like, I don't want to kill anybody. It's like, I don't want to kill anyone either. But if it's between me and them and all that stuff, it's like you can see it in them. Because when he's, like, counting down in that moment, like, she's freaking out. Like, we don't actually have to kill anyone, do we? I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm here for. I just want people to listen and give us the money. But they got to play that tough guy act. Um, and then he gives him the money. And I honestly think he cured him. I don't think they're ever going to rob anything again. I know people would be like, yeah, right, he was rewarded for that. You think he's going to quit after that? He's going to think his luck is, you know, infinite. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, it's possible, but I want to believe that Jules actually cured him there. And it really did kind of become the shepherd. And that was one of his many adventures. I'd watch a freaking sequel to Pulp Fiction where it's just Jules going around walking the earth. How amazing would that be? I'd watch that shit all day. Get on it, Quentin. That should be your last movie if you're going to make a tenth movie. The Further Adventures of Jules Winfrey. Hell yeah, give it to me. Anyway, guys, all right, that was a long motherfucking video. But hey, it's a two and a half hour classic with tons and tons of dialogue. There you go. Hey, Quentin, you want to call me up? I can do 40 minute takes without a breath, okay? I can do 40 minute takes, you know, uh, without, without stopping, without fucking up. Okay, I fucked up a little, but I don't got no script. So, there you go. Give, give me a call. I'll be here. All right, guys, let's move on.